What sparked your early interest in mathematics? Oh, when I was a little kid, uh, I was interested in kiddie science, how rockets work, things like that. And I quickly became um, uh, less than fully contented with the usual kiddie answers. And so I started checking books out of the library, uh, one of which was the college physics textbook. And I couldn't understand a single word. Uh, my father uh, told me, of, of course, you don't understand this book. It has math in it. You need to know more math. Oh, well, can I study some math? Uh, okay, Charlie, what, uh, what grade are you in? I'm in the fourth grade. Okay, uh, why don't I get you a fourth grade math book? And uh, you see what progress you make in it. We'll go from there. So um, that started it. And I made rapid progress, very rapid progress, and uh, uh, have never looked back. And, and while, while kitty science wasn't as fun, uh, I found quickly that math is, is so fascinating that uh, it, it was what I had to do. So that's how I got into math. And did that experience inform the research decisions that you made early in your career as a mathematician? Early in my career? Uh, no, I don't think so. It, it had maybe a little more influence on the research decisions that, that I made later in my career. But in, in the beginning, I think I was, uh, I, I was most strongly influenced by the uh, personality and the research interests of my advisor, Eli Stein. I, so I was very lucky to, to have as an advisor maybe the, the best teacher of advanced math in the world. And related to that, your academic grandfather is... Um, Anthony Zygmunt. Yes, yes. How would you say the Chicago School of Analysis has evolved since the time of Zygmunt? Well, so um, let me answer that by first saying what it was uh, uh, when I got involved, or, or even even maybe just before, and what, it, and then come to what it's uh, evolved into. So it it started being a, a group of specialists in in some arcane subject which was uh, of great and passionate interest to a few people uh, and of, um, of little interest uh, uh, to, to the mathematical world, uh, let alone to the scientific world. Uh, and what has happened is that, first of all, geographically, the, the uh, Chicago School has, has spread over the globe. And, but, the, but intellectually, now the, the thing is completely different. The ideas that uh, were being developed in the Chicago School in those days have become meat and potatoes for, I don't know, one third of the mathematicians in the world and have found very significant applications outside math. And what sort of applications? Um, okay, so let's see. Um, well, there's a subject called Littlewood-Paley theory, which, uh, which takes a signal, let's say, and tries to, to break it up into pieces uh, which are as elementary and simple as possible both in terms of their frequencies and in terms of where they are in time. And that has turned out to become a tremendously useful tool in, in many different, uh, in many different uh, fields. It's, so the, the key word is wavelets. It's used, for example, in the study of the flow of turbulent fluids, and it's being used in current attempts to, to reconstruct a, a nice audible sound from an old Edison cylinder of Brahms playing Brahms, and, and I don't know, a thousand other things. Um, if, if it isn't used right now in, in, the, uh, uh, in the encoding standard for HDTV, it soon will be. Um, uh, so this is one immensely important idea. But it, it's, it's simply a point of view which, which turned out to be fundamentally important. Is there a way to anticipate the development of mathematical ideas over time? Uh, not that I know of. Um, so... Uh, the, the particular ideas that I was just talking about uh, seemed very arcane, I think, right up until the moment that they first got applied. Uh, I would have sworn in blood that there was no chance that they would be applicable during my lifetime. On the other hand, every so often, um, uh, one hears uh, one promoter or another say that uh, something, something or other is going to change, is going to change the world. And uh, that's, I think, that one, one should view that with skepticism. One never knows that it's, if it is possible to tell, I think no one has yet found out how. There are various paths that a mathematician can take in their career. 
what motivates you to continue studying pure mathematics? Well, um, I couldn't put it down. It's so fascinating. It's so wonderful. Uh, I, I think I could not stop doing mathematics without becoming very sad. Simple as that. And how do you choose your research directions? Well, uh, okay, I don't choose the research direction. It chooses me. Every so often I hear about a problem, and, uh, and the problem seizes me, and, and I cannot stop thinking about it. Well, I sleep a few hours a night, but uh, it, it, it obsesses me. I, I cannot stop. Um, during many moments of discouragement, I would love to just give up, but I can't because the problem has got hold of me. And, uh, and that can continue over decades. And where do you find that inspiration? Um, I try to look for it everywhere, and every so often at random it strikes. Uh, I try to look for it within pure mathematics. I try to look for it in the world outside mathematics. Um, and it can come from anywhere. Is there one specific example that really stands out to you when you look back on your career as a mathematician? Uh, well, let's see. So I mentioned wavelets. Uh, here, here's something that I've been uh, obsessed with uh, for the last 10 years or so. I happen to have heard a lecture about 10 years ago by uh, Ed Beerstone, a Canadian mathematician who, as a matter of fact, right now is the director of the Fields Institute, on, on some problem that had been posed by um, Hassler Whitney, a great American mathematician in 1934, and um, had explained some some wonderful ideas that, that seemed relevant. And the problem, which would, uh, which I had not heard about before, immediately grabbed hold of me. It hasn't let go since. It appears now to be closely related to um, questions of how to, how to draw conclusions from data, I guess the fundamental question of statistics. Um, I am frustrated there is one particular reason, one constant in one lemma, why it does not have practical applications right now. And if I can just if, uh, if I can just manage to wrangle a better constant out of one lemma, then I think it will have very big applications in, in the outside world. That's one of the motivations that, that drives me to continue studying this problem. But but that took me by surprise, the connection with uh, with data, and uh, for the first, I don't know, roughly for the first half of the time that I was studying the question, uh, it never occurred to me that the connection might arise, but it did. It was driven by um, logical, uh, mathematical imperatives. And does your research ever find connections in industry? Um, the, the most significant connections by far come from wavelets. So um, wavelets were developed, not exclusively, but in large part, thanks to the research efforts of a few people working in the Chicago school. I, I was one of them. Um, so the work that we were doing back then, in the, that I was doing in the 70s and that they were doing in the 50s and 60s, um, contributed greatly to uh, something that turned out to be important for industry. That's, I think, by far the biggest uh, example in my own work. If the current stuff that I'm doing happens to pan out, and of course I have no way to know whether it will or not, then the applications to the outside world, I would guess, and it's always dangerous to guess, but I would guess would be either, well, so zero if it doesn't pan out, or large compared to the applications of, of wavelets if it does pan out. The world is full of data. One needs good ways to analyze data. Anything that really makes a fundamental advance in that will be very important for science and for everything. You have many academic descendants, um, three of whom are at the University of Toronto right now. I am very proud of them. <laughs> for young students today, do you think there should be changes made to the incentives that drive the research topics that they choose? Um, no, I think it would be very, very hard to make a systematic change that makes sense. Um, when, when a student picks a research topic, uh, the, the decision is influenced by 
the research interests of the advisor, the state of the field with which in which the, the problem uh, lives, the um, uh, the personality of the advisor, the chemistry between them, uh, who else is working on which other problem. It's immensely complicated, and and asking asking for for a sort of simple prescription for uh, how to assign research problems. It, it reminds me a little of the question of how to decide who should marry whom. Uh, I would hesitate to pass laws about who should marry whom. It's, uh, it's a sensitive process, and this is not so different. What is the relevance of mathematical research to society? Well, so I think there are, uh, I, I would say there are several uh, respects in which it's relevant. Uh, the first, the first simply has to do with the training of people. Uh, training in, in pure math is, or more generally tra training in math, um, is, um, is a, it gives a very special way of thinking which has been found to be useful in dealing with many problems in a changing world. So, so simply, uh, um, the fact that, that a lot of, uh, well, a lot, a certain number of people are, are trained uh, in the mathematical way of thinking, and then go out into the world and, and bring that way of thinking to bear on, on a tremendous variety of problems. That's one already that is a significant impact of, of mathematics on the world. Uh, then, then I would uh, consider also, let's say, the subset of math which is concerned with uh, specifically with applied problems, and there are a wide variety of problems in, in a world. Uh, uh, in which uh, science and technology are important, there's a wide variety of problems to which mathematics applies, and lots of mathematicians study specifically applied problems, and, and some of that work, uh, a lot of it is, is quite important. For the health of that, it is very important not to make artificial distinctions between pure pure math and, and applied. So on the one hand, I think it is, uh, what one hears sometimes, uh, um, that that uh, you know pure that, that pure math is is so beautiful and so pure and wonderful that it should distance itself from applied math. And on the other hand, one hears that applied math is so useful and important that it should distinguish itself from pure math. And, and that's a mistake. There are, I think uh, there are interesting problems and not so interesting problems, and that's the important distinction much more than pure versus applied. Uh, but then the the uh, the last respect in which I'd say that that math impacts on the world is that. Every so often, there is there is some huge discovery that changes everything, uh, and and math uh, has contributed its share of those uh, insights. The most obvious example is is the discovery of the electronic computer and the various things that, that go with it. So the idea, uh, the idea that let's say, well, so once upon a time, philosophers were interested in in understanding. Uh, let's say, how to make axioms for, for the truth, or at least, let's say, for all of mathematics. And, uh, well, there may be infinitely many axioms. Then how do you tell what is an axiom? Well, so it's all right to have infinitely many axioms if there is a completely mechanical procedure to decide what is an axiom or not. What is a completely mechanical procedure? Well, there were several different, different definitions which all led to the same idea. And, and one of these was, was the idea of a, of a computer and there was a mathematical theorem that among all possible computers, there was a universal computer that could do anything that uh, that any computer could do. It simply had to be programmed. So this was the idea of a programmable machine. Um, and that changed everything. And if mathematics had contributed nothing else to the world, that justifies the whole enterprise many times over. So, so again, I would say there are the three, there are the three things. There's the, the training of people with the uh, with a powerful uh, intellectual apparatus to go out and confront many problems. There, there are the uh, questions, uh, uh, the research topics that are specifically connected to, to applications. And then there's the, the random, uh, infrequent, immensely important uh, uh, idea that, that comes from God knows where and that cannot be predicted. My own prejudice is that of these three uh, impacts of, of math, the last one is the most important. But, but none of them should be ignored. Great. Okay. Thank you.